Well, today we begin a new series. I'm so excited about this series. Confessions of a Control Freak. I confess, I am a control freak, and I'm guessing many of you are. And just want to give you a little diagnostic, a little test to see if maybe you are a control freak, maybe your spouse is. If you're diagnosing your spouse, don't say you don't have a warning for me, okay? You might be a control freak if you reorganize all the dirty dishes in the dishwasher before, in perfect order before you wash the dishes, you might be a control freak. You might be a control freak if all the spices in your spice rack in your kitchen are in alphabetical order and all of the sweaters in your dresser are stacked by color code, you might be a control freak. You might be a control freak if you plan out in your mind where everybody at dinner is going to sit, exactly where they're going to sit, and you plan all the topics for conversation. You might be a control freak. You might be a control freak if you insist on driving all the time, God forbid, if you're in the passenger seat, and you almost scarred your kids for life when you actually t taught them how to drive. You might be a control freak. You might be a control freak if everybody at work thinks you're a little bossy or pushy, but actually they don't know half the things that are going through your head. You might be a control freak. <laughs> so the bottom line of this series, probably most of us, all of us in some way or another are a control freak. Control freaks. Maybe in many ways you and I are control freak. And the point of this whole message series is going to be that if we can just learn to surrender a little bit of that control, you know, really it's an issue of trust. If we can just learn to surrender a little bit, it will not only make our lives a little better, it will also help our relationship with God and His call to trust in Him. Well, to kick off this series, we're going to talk about a specific kind of way we can be control freaks, and that is with our image, with our image of ourself. You know, some people go at great lengths to present themselves in a certain way. Some people work at this very, very hard to, to just present themselves to their family or friends or co-workers in a perfect way, maybe for the crowd for popularity's sake, whatever the reason might be, and whatever, whoever the crowd might be. Oh, this might be the person, or I'm not picking on anybody here, this might be the person, for example, who takes a shower and even puts makeup on before they go to work out at the gym. <laughs> this might be the person who spends money they don't have on stuff they don't want to impress people they don't like could be a control freak with regard to your self-image. This could be the family that presents themselves as so perfect in every single way, but they don't, other people don't know that on the way to church, you know, on Sunday, they were fighting all the way, and then they get out and everybody's smiling and happy. Now this could be a problem with a person's projection and their self-image. It comes down to style, you know, it's always about it's always about style over, or style over function and the, the stuff we buy. It could be our lifestyle. We're really living beyond our means. And it could be, you know, just with, with, with family and friends trying to pr pr project this image. And it, it's an issue of control, and it's a problem that many of us have. I confess I have a little bit of problem with this as a priest. As a priest, I'm a kind of public figure. And... I want to be liked. We all want to be liked. And a lot of people need to market themselves maybe for their business. And I'll hear, you know, a thousand positive comments about the church and everything. But it's that one negative comment I'll hear that I'll then go to the staff and I'll say, what did I do wrong? And most of the time, you know what they'll say to me? Father, it's not about you. You didn't do anything wrong. It's not about you. Well, that's the first issue. If we obsess over trying to please the crowd over our self-image. It can be really, at its root, selfish and even prideful, pulling attention to us. And a second, a second reason why this is harmful is because it can sort of be based in fear. And here's what the Bible says about trying to impress other people. The Bible says, the fear of what others think of you is a trap. The fear of what others think of you is a trap. I love that verse from Proverbs. It's a snare. 
It's a trap, and that fear can also ultimately lead to places and, and just being where we don't want to be, like anxiety or depression or worse. So that trying to control our self-image, one, it could be prideful, it could be selfish, it could also be rooted in this fearfulness, but also it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of time and energy, and I want to speak to a couple different groups of people here. If you're a teenager, if you're a teenager or a young adult, I did want to say that we adults have no idea how much pressure you are in today. We, didn't, we weren't raised in the environment you are raised today. You know, with the pressure with your self-image, both in person and online and social media, you know, that intense pressure to impress other kids who might judge you because of your appearance or the way you look or how you dress. And I'll just say to you, teenagers, young adults, most likely about five years from now, you won't even remember those other kids' names, okay? <laughs> and second, I want to speak to moms or dads or even grandparents. You know, moms and dads, you're trying to impress these other parents at your kid's school or on the sports team. And it's just great work. But guess what? In a few years, your kid is going to go to another school. And you're going to have a no, whole other group of parents to try to impress. So why bother? And then I'll speak to just people who, who at work, maybe you're struggling to, to uh, get in with the crowd at work, trying to impress them with your skill and your knowledge and, and maybe even your stuff. You know what? Those other people, they're probably going to retire early and go to Florida, and they don't even care. See, ultimately, other people care, don't care. The crowd is fickle. So how can we get away from this struggle to control our self-image? How can we free ourselves a little bit from this struggle? I want to just look today, answer that question, at the gospel we heard, this wonderful story encounter between Jesus and Bartimaeus. So we hear this from Mark. Mark says, as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. Now just a little context. Jesus and his disciples and a crowd are traveling from the north in Galilee to the south in Jerusalem to the holy city for the feast of Passover. Jericho is a very, very, very ancient city. It goes back to almost 10,000 B.C., and it was at a crossroads. It was a kind of touristy city that would have a lot of travelers in it. And Jericho is about 20 miles from Jerusalem. It's not very far from Jerusalem. This big crowd would have been there passing through. You know, and, and uh, all, all people coming from the north, but including the crowd that Jesus uh, had following him. So just picture in your mind here in this scene at the gate of Jericho, New York City on New Year's Eve in Times Square. It was that kind of crowd, that kind of busy. And there were all these beggars there, of course. All these beggars, we hear about this one guy, Barnabas. Barnabas was blind. And that means he was destitute. He had to beg for a living. So he hears about Jesus in the crowd, and here's what Mark tells us. Mark tells us this, on hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Bartimaeus began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. So Bartimaeus, the blind man, has an insight. He actually sees who Jesus is, even though he's blind. He calls him this title, son of David. The title son of David indicates that Jesus is the Messiah. So Bartimaeus, even though he's blind, he's heard about Jesus, his reputation in some way, and he has a kind of spiritual sight. But then, as he's crying out, he's crying out to Jesus, here's how the crowd reacts. Mark tells us this, but many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Now, this is sort of the point today. So the crowd all around uh, Bartimaeus doesn't really care about him. They're telling him, shut up, be quiet. You're a poor blind beggar. We don't want to bother with you. Just go away. And isn't this how often, it's how so often the poor are treated? Now, Bartimaeus could have given in to the crowd. He could have just listened to the crowd and kept quiet and shut up. But he didn't. He kept going. And here's what, what, here's what he does. But he kept calling out all the more. Son of David, have pity on me. 
So instead of being quiet listening to the crowd, he persists. You know, we can learn something about prayer from his persistence. If we have something we want to be free of, we want to have spiritual sight in something, in our own blind spots, keep on praying. Be persistent. So here's what Jesus then finally does next. He says, call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, get up. Jesus is calling you. So Jesus hears him, and he calls him. And notice here that the same crowd that had told him to shut up and go away, that was just an annoyance to them, now they flip. They flip and they say, look, you have attention now from Jesus, so go call him, have courage. And just this reminds me that, you know what? The crowd is fickle. The crowd is, is very fickle. You get their attention for 15 minutes, great. You'll have your 15 minutes of fame, but the crowd doesn't really care about you. You know, maybe you make some kind of a cat video on YouTube and you get a million hits. So you get be famous for 15 minutes and that's it. The crowd is fickle. But here, here is what the blind man does. He hears Jesus call and he throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. This is a significant gesture. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Throwing off his cloak. So normally, this blind beggar would be sitting down in the ground. He'd have his cloak on his lap. That was actually his source of income. He maybe had a bunch of coins in his cloak that day. This gesture of throwing off his cloak is a gesture of faith and surrender. It's a gesture of trust. Probably all the coins he collected that day scattered all over. He had no chance of getting them back because he was blind. Other people would have picked them up and scooped them up. But here is, here is uh, what happens then. He goes to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? That's a fundamental question that Jesus asks every single one of us. What do you want me to to do for you. So the apostles next to Jesus were probably thinking, duh, Jesus, what do you think he wants? He's a blind man. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, of course, Bar Bartimaeus says this. He says, Master, I want to see. So again, Bartimaeus, even though he's blind, has spiritual sight. He's one of the few human beings in the gospel story who recognizes Jesus as who he is. He, even though he's blind, he sees. He has faith in his master, and therefore he receives healing. So here's the end of the story. Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has saved you immediately. He received his sight and followed him on the way. The blind beggar, if he had, if he had obeyed the crowd and kept silent, he would have died a blind beggar. But instead, he went against the crowd he seized the chance of a lifetime and he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, my friends, today, you know, we might, we might struggle with this, this uh, idea of trying to control our self-image. And we can learn some different things from, from, this from this story between Jesus and the blind Bartimaeus. First, that the crowd is fickle. They don't care about us. You know, and, and second... Uh, you know, to have courage to go against the crowd to follow the Lord, whatever He's calling us to, to really trust in Him. And maybe third, just a very specific thing if you're struggling with this kind of control issue. Make a, make a fast, make a sacrifice of some way. So if you are struggling with that particular crowd at school, all those other kids who want to judge you and want to influence you, fast from spending time with them. Just stay away from them for a while. If you have the same problem at work or with a group of friends, you know, just stay away from that group for a while. And here's the biggest one of all today, 2021. If you struggle with this online, whether it's online shopping or whether it's with Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever way, fast from those things. Fast from those things that are feeding this sense of trying to control your self-image. And then take that time, and all of us can do this this week, take your time, that extra time to pray. Pray like blind Bartimaeus did in the Gospel story today. Encounter Jesus' presence. He is always present, 
but enter into his presence and his presence and his power. And then persist in prayer. Don't give up. Keep on crying out whatever that need we have. Be specific. Like Bartimaeus was, Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't have to ask him that question, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus already knew. But God wants us always to be specific in our prayer that, that we may really understand more deeply ourselves. And then just don't give up. Rely on that power and in and, and His presence to find the healing and the freedom that He wants you to have. Well, bottom line, my friends, this series is about letting go and letting God. Letting go and letting God. When it comes to our self-image, just play to an audience of one. Amen.